so the uh, topic that is allocated to me seems to imply that I have to justify that uh, US guided gastric variceal endotherapy is the definitive therapy uh, for practically all situations. Uh, the short answer is no, and uh, possibly neither will it be. I'll pos try to give you a more balanced nu nuance of how US endotherapy stands in today's era. And when we talk of treatment options for gastric viruses, we have three categories of options. One is endoscopic treatment, and more applicable and more widely used in community, let us be honest, is freehand glue injection. US guided endotherapy include glue, coil, coil glue, and thrombin and other material, gel foam, etc., injected, and others. And as we go along, we will discuss how US guided endotherapy fares with a with freehand glue injection. We also have interventional radiology procedures, which is tips with integrate transvenous obliteration and retrograde transvenous obliteration, BRTO and its variants. Now if we see these three categories of treatment, they are conceptually different. What we do with endoscopy is we treat the intramural collaterals, prolapsing collaterals, which are likely to bleed. It's a local treatment. We do nothing to the portal circulation. When we talk of tips, we are creating a new shunt in the person from portal to systemic circulation. We are creating a shunt. When we talk of BRTO, we are closing a pre-existing shunt. So conceptually, they are different, and we should learn when and how to apply these modalities. Now, when we have such a patient with active spurting bleeding, you would all agree the goal is to obviously stop this bleeding by whatever means, be it freehand glue injection. But this is one situation where US shines. It really shines. Why? Because I can look through the blood. US can look through the blood. If there is a clot in the fundus, it doesn't obscure our view. We can still go ahead and do an endotherapy, unlike many situations when with freehand glue injection, the endoscopic view is badly obscured. The, the key point with US endotherapy is that endoscopically you are blind during US, so you must take care to prevent aspirations. And for that, my recommendation is you make an injection, bring out the US scope, pass a gastroscope, do suction, again do an endotherapy, and don't cringe on wasting needles. I do not like to intubate such patients despite the torrential bleed because most often they have large shunts and then subsequently weaning them because of the encephalopathy is very difficult in my limited experience, although this, this thing is open to debate. We inject, inject coil glue, as Dr. Eddy has said, and subsequently they may or may not ulcerate and come out. Uh, sorry, to go back, what about the IR procedures in this setting? Most often you would think that this patient is very difficult to be brought onto the IR suet, and this patient would likely not make it to the suet. There is only one study from ILBS. We have then done a BRTO in 52 patients as a salvage procedure when endoscopic treatment, endoscopic, direct endoscopic glue injection failed, and they achieved a 92% one-year survival in this cohort of patients. This is the only existing study of a BRTO procedure in such acute situations. More often, we are uh, led to deal with elective situation. The patient has bled, we have controlled his bleeding, and now you have to decide to prevent re-bleeding should you inject glue, US glue, or a IR procedures. And my recommendation is, these are my view, independent views, you may or may not agree with it, that three things are to be done in such procedures, uh, in such patients. First, clinical evaluation, two a CT, C, CT, and third is a echocardiography. And then you look at these features, the features in red would bias you towards tips. These are portal vein or splanchnic thrombosis, ascites or hydrothorax, untreated esophageal varices. And now if you do a tips, you not only treat the bleeding, you also treat the associated conditions. Obviously the patient does not have to be too old and has to have a favorable meld in a Freiburg index of post-tip survival. The points in blue, favorable anatomy for RTO, and all the contraindications or risk factors for TIPS, which are advanced stage, cardiopulmonary contraindication, ejection fraction less than 40, a mean pulmonary artery pressure more than 45, encephalopathy, sarcopenia, meld more than 20, and FIPS favor a RTO. Please note that with this clinical algorithm, you divide your patients, stratify them into favoring a TIPS or favoring a RTO. 
Endotherapy remains a viable option here and endotherapy also remains a viable option here. So in a nutshell, when you stratify your patients, you have to choose whether you do a TIPS with endo or endotherapy or you do a RTO or endotherapy and I'll, in the next two slides, I'll you take, take you through them. So in the group of patients where, where TIPS is applicable, how do you choose whether to do TIPS or endotherapy? I must concede that there has been no comparison of EUS coil glue with TIPS. These data are lacking. But we can fall back on very old studies when TIPS with bare stent was compared to freehand endoscopic glue and coil. And these are three old studies, one RCT. And the common denomination here was that with TIPS you had lower rebleeding, higher HE and no difference in survival. We must also understand that the diameter of a tip shunt is way smaller than the diameter of a gastrorenal shunt. So even if you place a tips, the flow through the gastrorenal shunt persists and the flow through the gastric varices will often persist. So when we talk of tips, we talk of tips plus anterograde obliteration of the feeders or the viruses directly. When we talk of RTO, again, there is no comparison of US coil glue with service RTO. So we do not know where this modality stands in comparison with the interventional radiology. There have been uncontrolled studies which have shown that RTO, BRTO is more effective than endoscopic glue. And there is one recent RCT published in Hepatology in 2021. Again, this was a comparison with freehand glue, which showed that RTO was more effective. But then the data where in patients who have applicability of BRTO, whether we should be doing BRTO or we should be doing US glue, is still open subject. Now, this is how I choose. This is a more common question which we face. Freehand glue or EUS glue? And this is something which conundrum which we face every day and these are just my views. The house may or may not agree to it. I look at the varix characteristics. All gastric varices are not the same. If it is along the lesser curve, then freehand endoscopic glue if you are in India, a banding if you are in the West on these and endoscopic glue coil doesn't apply. I like to classify the cardiofundal viruses by the Arakawa classification and I'll show you in the next slide. And Arakawa 1, you can do either. In Arakawa 2, US coil glue is not very good and you have to go back to freehand the glue injection. If the varix is big, if it is a large varix, I would favor a US coil and glue for many reasons. Coagulopathy. Now this may be a contentious issue. If a patient has coagulopathy, I don't want to puncture the varix on the luminal side. I'd rather take my US scope and puncture it transcrurally from the behind with the crust as a scaffold so that there is no surface ulceration. And I think this is a safer bet. If there is active bleeding with fundus obscured, I've already mentioned US coil glue is better. Again, something which I practice but which is not often acknowledged, a known right to left cardiac shunt in cirrhotics, IPVDs, intrapulmonary vascular dilatations, a patient with HPS, they have a lot of shunts. I'm worried about glue embolization. Here, I would possibly choose a US endotherapy, and so much so, I would often restrict myself to coils in this case and even avoid glue altogether. Now, this is the classification I was talking of. This is the classification I use in practice. I use the Arakawa classification and to stratify which patients I would use EUS and where I would use a freehand uh, glue injection. Arakawa 1, and this is an old paper, a nicely described paper. Arakawa 1 is a localized varix. There is a big one bunch, you puncture it once and you can obliterate it with EUS. Arakawa 2 is diffuse, which we commonly see. There are multiple F2, F3 nodular tumorous viruses going around in the fundus, which we commonly see. When we say do US in IgV1 and GOV2, we do not acknowledge that many GOV2 will have this morphology. You will have a multiple bunch of viruses classifying as GOV2. You make one injection here and you leave the other viruses. That is not wise. If you are using a US endotherapy here, then you must combine it with freehand glue injection. The idea is to obturate all the viruses. But in general, such morphology, Arakawa 1, should favor a US this morphology should favor a freehand glue injection because you would waste many needles if you are trying to deal with this and, and with EUS guidance. Just my view. What about the objective comparisons of the endoscopic versus EUS guided treatment? This is a nice big meta-analysis, 23 studies by Babu P. Mohan, a recent meta-analysis. 
and look that the treatment efficacy, overall treatment efficacy of endo endoscopic glue versus EUS glue is actually the same. You don't gain any treatment efficacy by overall, by EUS guidance in unselected overall patients. And these are unselected patients and that is the problem. Also, no difference in early rebleeding and late rebleeding with a EUS guidance and obliteration rates are more with EUS guidance. And that's where we are. What about the EUS guided modalities? Now we have, can do, there was a question in last session, EUS glue alone, EUS coil alone, and EUS coil plus cyanoacrylate. And again, this is a wonderful meta-analysis which sums the existing data. When we see the clinical success, it is highest when you use EUS with coil and cyanoacrylate and least when you use a US coil alone. And many people use US coils because they want to save the needle. But the efficacy is the lowest if you omit glue from endotherapy. What about the adverse events? The adverse events obviously are the least when you use coil alone because they are least likely to embolize and cause trouble. And they are highest when you use significantly high when you just inject glue alone with US guidance. Reinterventions and bleeding, that is what you want, are least with EUS coil and cyanoacrylate. And so possibly, in my view, currently the standard of care is to inject coil followed by glue. Choice of coil, number of coil, volume of glue, you can tailor. But one should not cringe and as far as possible, one should combine coil and cyanoacrylate glue rather than choosing one over the other. That's the, my take. We are all worried about distant glue embolization. And we know that when we do a freehand endoscopic glue, we get embolization in around 5 to 7 percent of the cases. I have looked into the literature for this talk and I have tabulated the studies. For EUS cyanoacrylate studies which have reported on embolization, I could find three studies. For EUS coil and cyanoacrylate which have reported embolization, I have found four studies. And if you look at this rates of pulmonary embolization, you see they are all over the place. 20, 47%, 2.5%, 6.5%, 0.8%, 25%, 2.5%, What to make of this data? When we look at this carefully, it would seem that patients are mostly asymptomatic. And if you look at asymptomatic glue embolization, your rates are very high. If you look at symptomatic embolizations, your rates are low. It stands to reason. It also seems, seems from this tabulated data that if you add lipoidol, your embolization rate significantly goes up. And which also stands to reason because it delays polymerization. I have one minute, 50 seconds. Okay, I'll finish. But I think the true reason is that Glue alone is invisible on x-rays, and if you try to look for pulmonary embolization with glue alone, even if you clinically suspect it, you can't see it on CT or x-rays. And when we mix lipoidol, you just end up by picking more embolization. So this may be a true effect, but this may be also increased detection by the mixing of lipoidol to glue that you are picking up more asymptomatic embolizations. But the bottom line is, then when you use a US guided endotherapy, you do not obviate the risk of glue embolization. We still have to be careful. And the incidence of glue embolization possibly, unlike what we would like to believe, is the same. The other problem is obviously lack of dedicated accessories. These are intravascular coil. We have such a kind of uh, trolley in my department. We, we sort of uh, screw the intravascular coil, push in the coil with the stylus, remove the whole thing, and then again manipulate the coil. So very soon we should have dedicated needles with built-in coils for endotherapy, but so far we have to make do with these. Cost of EOS and coil and glue. In my center, one coil costs between 7,000 to 10,000 Indian rupees, one coil. Lipoidal vial is 17,000 per vial. A 19G needle I never reuse, we can't reuse, costs 20,000 to 30,000 rupees and we may end up using two or three needles. So procedure costs and overhead if you add, in practice, uh, the one session will often go from 70,000 to one lakh or even more 
for a glue injection and many patients in India cannot actually afford this modality. Hence, one has to use this wisely where applicable. So this was my last slide, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to summarize. The choice of endotherapy modality for gastric viruses should be dictated very importantly by patient clinical profile, the vascular anatomy on CT, and the gastric morphology on endoscopy. There is no one-size-fit-all solution here. EUS-guided endotherapy offers higher eradication rate, lower recurrence rate, but has no advantage in re-bleeding over direct endoscopic glue injection. I think that bigger viruses, actively bleeding patients, those with coagulopathy, may benefit from EUS-guided endotherapy. Overall embolization rates, unlike what we would like to believe, are not reduced with EUS endotherapy. Most embolizations are asymptomatic. EUS coil and glue has advantage over EUS coil alone and EUS glue alone. And EUS endotherapy obviously is limited by expertise, cost, and lack of dedicated devices. Thank you.